Heather's here, so I'm going to let Heather say hi and tell everybody about Dementia Alliance real quick, and then you can introduce Kent. <laughs> Perfect. Well, um, thank you all for being with us today and for Kent for sponsoring this session. Um, Dementia Alliance of North Carolina is really committed to helping families that are living with dementia right here in North Carolina and anywhere else that they want to join us from. Um, but, you know, with the, with the holidays coming up, we realized that we're going to be seeing loved ones and we're going to be seeing loved ones that we may not have seen in a while um, or been all together. And so so we thought that this was a, an important topic to, to cover, to uh, get out into the world and record. And I know that it'll help some other people that may not even be registered here today as well. So um, again, thank you to Lisa and Kent for putting on the hard work and, and getting this planned. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kent Thompson with Capital Financial Solutions. Okay. Um, I'm not used to doing this. So um... Uh, you know, I guess I get into this because I, I serve on a committee uh, here in, in Wake County. Uh, we're appointed by the county commissioners, and our duty is to go visit all of the assisted living homes and family care homes in Wake County. So our committee is uh, 25 people. We divide up into teams, and we go visit the homes. So I've noticed over the years, um, you know, there are more and more memory care portions or, or, or parts to a lot of the assisted living homes and um, the, the memory care area varies wide, wildly, wide, widely um, from people that are more higher functioning to people that are, you know, just, just being taken care of. But, um, you know, as I get older, um, you know, I, I worry about dementia and so dementia is one of the areas that I like to support and I like the way Dementia Alliance does it. And so that's why I've come on board. Uh, I am a financial advisor. Um, people come to me talking about uh, things like retirement income and long-term care and investments and, and things like that. And oftentimes um, somebody will be managing the money for their parent and they're a little bit reluctant to do that because they feel like if they make a mistake or, or something goes awry, you know, they'll get blamed for it. And uh, that can be an uncomfortable conversation at the uh, Christmas dinner table when, you know, Junior was managing the money and all of a sudden it went down for some reason. And so now everybody's pointing their finger at him. So oftentimes we are asked to come in and be the money manager uh, for them to take on that responsibility. But uh, all in all, um, you know, certainly if there's any questions or anything I can do, feel free to contact me and let me know what I can do. Thank you so much, Kent. And thank you all for joining us. We have a small crew today. Welcome, Patrice. So um, uh, feel free to um, turn your cameras on if you want to. If you can't, I understand. Um, I think that we've got such a great group that feel free to unmute and chime in, ask questions, share stories. Um, I know we've got some folks that are professional caregivers here, and we've got some folks that are family caregivers, and I imagine we have a lot of people that are both professional and family caregivers, so please feel free to join in. We are going to talk about uh, watching for signs of dementia when we visit for the holidays, and I'm just going to share my screen really quickly or try to share my screen. We'll see how this goes. All righty, can everybody see that? Great, thanks for the head nod, Kent. So again, we wanna thank Kent for helping us put this together. He's joined into a lot of our programs and education series and walks, and we really appreciate the support. Um, the mission of Dementia Alliance, as Heather kind of mentioned, is to help North Carolinians affected by dementia. And that means family members too. Um, but we know, of course, that dementia isn't specific to North Carolina. So uh, we definitely are um, very excited to have people from out of state with us as well. So um, we are going to start off with just talking about what we've been wondering about our family members. Um, 
I know that when we first notice changes with families, often we're like, hmm, are they just getting older or is there really an issue? Should I really be concerned? What's going on? Um, so we need to kind of understand what age related changes are first and what dementia is second before we can figure out if there's really any issues happening. So to understand dementia, we have to understand normal aging. So as we age, and I'm sure since we all do it, you guys have noticed that our mental processing does slow down a little bit, just takes us a little longer to think through things. Sometimes I'd like to think that that's because we are wiser now and we think before we act. Um, but either way, it slows down a little bit and our motor speed also slows down some. Uh, our brains were created to do one thing at a time. And of course, society asks us to do 20 or so things at a time. And so um, as we age, it's harder and harder for us to multitask. So not being able to focus as well or not being able to do five things at once comes with aging as well as dementia. So it's, it's kind of a fine line. We have to figure that out. And we also know that there are decreases in vision and hearing that happen over time. There's a lot of studies I'm sure you've heard lately about hearing loss related to dementia. And so we know that hearing loss can be a risk factor for dementia. Um, but it's one thing too, is the person just not hearing us well and so they're not answering correctly or not answering at all, or is it something more? And these are all things we'll look at. So have you ever had trouble recalling someone's name? And I certainly hope I'm not the only one. Um, you know, I meet someone and I know their name and then I see them in the grocery store later and I'm like, oh, hi, how are you? And the name just blanks on me. And then I can remember it later on in the evening. It comes back later. And that's a good sign when you can remember that later. Uh, other things like uh, tip of the tongue, where you're trying to find a specific word and it's sitting right on the tip of the tongue, you know what you want to say, but it's hard to find that specific word. That happens quite a bit as well. So we want to kind of understand that that's normal um, and it just takes us a little bit longer to find the word that we're looking for. Another thing that I call hereafter disease is when you remember something when you're on the couch or sitting in front of the TV, and then you go into the kitchen to do whatever it was, and you forgot why you were there. Now, why did I come into the kitchen? What did I want? And I call that hereafter disease because you forget what you're here after. Ha ha ha. But usually what happens if we go back into the room where we were and we sit down, it falls back into our brain and generally we run into the kitchen so we don't forget again what it was. And that's a, a episodic memory and that's normal, that happens normally. The other thing is, is how about those of us who, especially this time of year, we're shopping and the parking lots are filled to the brim with cars and you go in the store, you get excited, the thing you wanted is on sale and you come back out you have no idea where your car is. Um, that's very, very normal. I have a couple suggestions for that. One is usually we don't remember where our car is because we're not paying attention when we park the car. We're already thinking about what we're gonna do in the store or what we're gonna do after we get out of the store. So when you park the car, take a second to look around and see where you are. And look where you are in front of the store. So you're in front of the W, or you're in front of the A, whatever it is, that'll help narrow it down. In most of our parking lots, at least in North Carolina, there's not a lot of trees. So park near the tree. That will also help you find your car. So if you can remember to do all those things, you're good. You're fine. Um, that's normal aging. So then what is dementia? Dementia is more than all of those things. Dementia is a group of symptoms. It's a condition. 
if you will. It's an umbrella term where we have all of these symptoms together. And when all of those pieces fit together for that puzzle, that's dementia. So we often think Alzheimer's and dementia are the same thing. And they're not. Alzheimer's is a disease that causes dementia. Um, it is not a normal part of aging. It is where there are two or more areas of brain function that are challenged that we're really having difficulty with, where we're having, um, where things are not working normally for us, where we're actually seeing a problem with day-to-day -day living because of these things. Um, it is different than normal for us. So it, if I can never remember somebody's name and I still can't, that's not different for me. But if you always remember people's names and you're starting to forget them, then that would be a warning sign for you. There's a lot of different causes of dementia and depending on who you talk to, there's a hundred. So this umbrella picture, if you will, just gives you an idea of some of them. So you'll see in the larger box, you'll see Alzheimer's dementia. And that's the most common, it's the most prevalent. Then there's things like vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia. You can have dementia from a stroke. You can have dementia from um, a brain mass, so many different causes of dementia. You can also have more than one of these things going on at a time. So how do we know if it's this or if it's something else, you know, what else could it be? When do we actually start to worry? So the first thing we have to keep in mind is even if we've seen changes, mom's a little slower to respond. Um, you know, it, it takes a little more time for dad to, to answer my questions. It could be other things. It could be medical conditions. It could be medication interactions. It could be poor nutrition and dehydration. We know that most seniors tend to be dehydrated. They just don't drink enough ever. But if the dehydration gets extreme, it can cause some symptoms like dementia. It could be those vision or hearing changes that we were talking about. If someone can't see as well or hear as well, things aren't gonna be done in the house. Uh, vitamin deficiencies, thyroid problems. So we don't want to automatically go, oh, mom couldn't remember something. It must be Alzheimer's disease. We want to say, oh, mom couldn't remember something. Is that typical? Or are we starting to see that happening more and more often? And what else could it be? So it's not always the dreaded dementia, if you will. Now let's look really quickly at risk factors. Go through this list with me and think of your loved one, but also think of yourself because the more risk factors we have, the greater our risk for dementia. So age is the greatest risk factor. And they say being 60 or 65, is sort of the area where we start to kind of watch out for things. And then as we age, our risk gets greater. Our health is of course. Are we healthy? Are we not? Do we have any of the things we're going to talk about in a little while? Does this run in our family? Genetics are a risk factor as well. So if some type of dementia does run in your family, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it, but it does mean that your odds do increase. Um, do we have a repeated head injury or traumatic brain injury, or have we had a lot of concussions, maybe from playing sports? Um, you know, those kinds of things do increase our risk of dementia. And then there's things like things that we can control, like high blood pressure and diabetes, smoking, um, alcoholism, um, Lack of education, maybe that's something we can't control, but they have done studies now that show that lack of education is a risk factor. Um, lack of exercise is another one. So all those things that we know are good for our heart and our body are also good for our brain. Another thing that has just been added to the list is air pollution. And that's something we don't often talk about, but the air quality where we are in our environment they um, now know that that can affect our brain, those chemicals coming into our system. We know that women are at higher risk than men. People of African-American descent 
are higher than people of Hispanic descent, and both of those groups are higher than people of Caucasian descent. Um, a lot of that has to do with vascular health as well. Um, so we just need to make sure that we're monitoring all the things that we can for both ourselves and our loved ones. Now, if someone actually has Alzheimer's disease or one of these other dementias, we're not gonna be able to cure that. We can slow down our risk factors. We can change our lifestyle. We can create a healthier body. We can slow changes, but ultimately, um, if it is true dementia, we're not gonna be able to reverse that. If it's um, medication interactions, those kinds of things, we can do something about it. And the medications that are out there for dementia are medications that slow the progression of the disease. So it is very, very important for us to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves, watching those things, monitoring blood pressure, all of that sort of stuff. So we're gonna get into warning signs now. And I always caution everybody, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment here. I always caution everybody about these warning signs because there's sometimes when I hear them that I could go, uh-oh, that might be a problem. Or, that might be a problem. Hmm, that might be a problem. So what I like to say is the more red flags, the more of a concern. But again, the red flags might mean something other than dementia. So let's see if we can get back to those and look at these. So we have things like memory loss. Um, so we automatically think of memory loss when we think of uh, dementia. It is not necessarily the first sign of dementia for some of the other dementias, non-Alzheimer's dementias, but it is a common enough thing that if someone is starting to have especially short-term memory issues, long-term memory issues, not so much, but short-term memory issues, um, and, and keep in mind that these changes happen over months and years. So if somebody is fine today and all of a sudden tomorrow they have a problem, there's probably something physical going on with them, something that immediately needs to get checked by a healthcare provider. But if we're seeing subtle changes, and often, you know, we hear, oh, I didn't really notice that until you told me about it. Now looking back over time, yeah, it's been a problem for a while, but I just didn't notice it. So let's look at these other red flags. Difficulty performing familiar tasks. If we start to have trouble with things that we do day in and day out, there definitely could be an issue there. Uh, disorientation to time and place. If I go to the grocery store the same way and I've been doing that for five years now and suddenly I get lost on the way home, that might be a problem. Poor or decreased judgment. Um, changes in mood and behavior. Sometimes we say, wow, he's just really not acting like himself. I don't know what's going on. But again, if there's these other signs too, maybe there's a problem. Misplacing things or the inability to retrace our steps. You know, if you, you lose your keys, a lot of times you can say, well, where have I been that I would have put my keys down? And you can find them that way. But often people with dementia can't do that anymore. Changes in personality and withdrawal. A lot of times when people do start to have problems, and we'll talk about how aware people are of these problems in just a minute, but when we notice that people are having problems a lot of times, um, it, it makes it so they don't wanna be around other people. If I'm forgetting, if I can't remember your name, if I can't follow a conversation, often I will withdraw. So an example might be someone who's usually the life of the party at Thanksgiving or Christmas suddenly has become more quiet and is not participating in conversations. Then we know that there might be a problem. So have any of you noticed any of these warning signs in your loved ones? You can, um, in the chat, there is an area where you can do a thumbs up or a thumbs down. 
or you can type in the chat and tell me if you've noticed any of these issues, maybe in yourself um, and definitely within your person that you're, you're worried about. And again, remember that one problem, one red flag might not be a big problem, but more and more of these red flags are definitely leading us to think we need to talk to a healthcare provider, doing something else. So I'm seeing some positive responses there. So if we're concerned about these things and then we go and we visit our loved one or they come and they visit us and we're noticing more difficulties, then definitely it's something that we need to proceed with. So let's take a look now at some of the things that we actually want to sort of notice when we go to visit our loved one or, or when we um, they come to see us. So the first thing would be um, if physical changes. Um, so yeah, Sharon said changes in social behavior, lost items, unable to retrace steps and to find items. And, and that could be us on a bad day, right? But when we notice that it's happening day after day after day, then definitely it's more of a problem. Definitely we say there is something going on. So let's look at these warning signs now, if you will. And let's talk about, and feel free to interrupt me or add your thoughts or comments to the chat. So the first one would be physical changes. And one thing right off the bat is when you go in and you hug your person, when you give them a big hug, especially if you haven't seen them in quite a while, you know, what do you feel? Do you feel somebody that's lost a lot of weight or maybe gained a lot of weight? Now, it's not something we want to go in and we want to go, oh, man, you are so thin because that might make the person upset. But we can go, oh, mom, feels like you lost a, lot of, a little bit of weight and see what the response is to that. Um, if someone has dropped quite a bit of weight or even gained a lot of weight, we know something is going on. So we know we wanna look at that a little bit further. Another thing to look at is changes in posture, balance and movement. So balance might be when I turn around in the kitchen, do I get unsteady as I do that? How do I do on stairs compared to how I used to do? Movement might be simply, am I walking as well as I used to? Am I, have, am I moving slowly? Am I having trouble with that? So just those small things that we maybe wouldn't necessarily pay attention to. If we go outside for a walk after our meal and we have to slow down a lot because dad just can't seem to keep up like he usually can, there may be something going on. And then we also want to look at signs of falls. Signs of falls might be bruising or soreness. Now, sometimes we bump into the corner of the bed and, and we get a bruise on our leg. But if that happened, I could tell you where that bruise came from. If, if I can't tell you how I got that bruise or you see a lot of bruising or maybe a lot of um, skin tears on my arms where my skin has gotten kind of, uh, where my skin is thin and I've torn that skin, um, we want to look at those things to see, and that can be challenging because maybe somebody is wearing long sleeves the whole time we're with them. Um, you don't want to go in and, and say, okay, let me see you, and let me see your arms, and let me see your legs, and let me examine every ounce of you, but if you do notice these things, it's something else to keep in mind. Um, so another thing to look at is hygiene. And we are way out of, let's see if I can make it go back. There we go, hygiene. So um, things like body odor, wearing clothes out of season, uh, wearing clothes the wrong way. Um, I caught myself before I went out of the house the other day with my shirt on backwards, thank goodness. Uh, I just had a little t-shirt on and it doesn't have an actual tag. It has one of those printed tags in there, but I caught it and I changed it. Maybe we're, we're seeing that happen more and more often with our loved one. Or another thing might be if we see them wear the same thing a couple of times during the visit. Um, 
if they if they're not changing clothes or they're wearing the same shirt and what is the reason for that you know do they say oh well i didn't get it dirty yesterday so i wanted to wear it again if that's not common for our person that really could be a red flag that they're not changing clothes and then other things like does someone usually have really good mouth care they never have bad breath and suddenly you're knowing noticing that they're having bad breath or um if they always get up from the table to go brush their teeth after a meal and they're not doing that anymore. Small little changes like that um, are, are noticeable. So um, I wonder, Sharon, if you might share, I know you've seen some small changes with your mom, but are there any of these hygiene kind of things that you've noticed as well as the social changes? And anybody else can feel free to chime in too. Um, my dad has dementia and I have noticed that, um, he can still, you know, change his shirt when he's getting ready to go out, that kind of thing. But until he has a reason to change, he generally wears the same shirt all day, unless he has a reason to change that shirt used to be maybe in the morning, he would go out and change. So, okay. Now let's look at the environment. So as you're walking through someone's house, and this would be, of course, if you're visiting them, but are there stains where there weren't before? Is there mold somewhere? And you go, oh, ah, there's mold in the bathroom, especially those hard to reach spots. Um, are there scorch marks in the kitchen where maybe a kitchen towel caught on fire? Um, those can be warning signs. Now, yes, we have all had the maybe once in a lifetime um, thing where we accidentally caught something on fire, hopefully well, not seriously, or we left a burner on, but if someone doesn't catch that. And Sharon just added the inability to select appropriate clothing for weather. And that's a really big sign, no coat when it's cold. And sometimes people can cover and they don't wear their coat. And they say, no, no, I don't need my coat. And they get outside and they're like, oh, I guess I should have worn my coat, it is cold. But if that's something that mom didn't have a problem with before, or you see is happening more and more often, or if their temperature, general body temperature has changed, if they usually have been just comfortable in a general room and they seem to be cold all the time, that can be another sign. People with dementia have a diff more difficult time regulating their body temperature. Now that could be from other health issues as well, but again, a warning sign. Thank you for sharing that, Sharon. So we wanna see things like, is there any water damage where a sink, a bathroom sink, kitchen sink might've overflowed? Um, does the laundry seem clean or is the laundry all piled up and not being done and put away? And is the house in general as clean as it usually is? Uh, now there can be a lot of reasons for these things again. And, and as I was, you know, typing out this list on here, I thought, oh gosh, is my house as clean as it usually is because people haven't been coming over because of COVID and I hope so, but um, if anybody comes over, let me know if it's not because um, you know, I want to be aware of that, but maybe your loved one is not aware of that and see how they respond to you when you ask them about it. When you look in the refrigerator, are there foods that are past their expiration date or are there moldy foods? Um, you know, we all do that occasionally with the thing way back in the fridge, but if you're noticing that, it could be a problem, something to look at. Another big thing to look at would be expired medications, or are there too many or too few pills depending on when the prescription was filled? So if I know mom takes a certain pill and she takes two pills a day and we're halfway through the month and there's a lot of pills in that bottle still, it might cue me to think, huh, has she been taking her pills on time? maybe not. Or if she's almost out of pills and, you know, it's not time to get that prescription filled, she says something like, well, the pharmacy told me that it wasn't time for me to get my prescription filled, but they may have that wrong because I need some more medicine. 
it could mean that, you know, the pharmacy messed up, but it also could mean that mom has been taking too much medication, getting confused, forgetting when she's taking a pill and so taking another one. And that can cause a big problem. We know a lot of people move into assisted living communities simply for medication management because they can't take meds on their own anymore. And then there's things like, uh, is the house as organized as it usually is? Is the linen closet a mess and it's usually not? Um, and what's the reason for that? Now, a lot of times people with dementia have this thing that's called confabulation. And it's where our brain makes sense of things that don't make sense. And so I'll give you an example. If I saw someone who looked like Kelly in the grocery store later, and I went up to her and I went, oh, hey, how are you? Now, this is a stranger. And I go, oh, yeah, well, I saw you earlier. And that stranger is going, no, I don't think we've met ever. And I say, yeah, yeah, we've known each other for a long time. It's because she looks familiar. And so my brain has filled in the gaps of the information of how would I know her? And even though I don't really know her, my brain thinks it makes sense and thinks I know this person just because she looks like someone I saw earlier. And so it's not on purpose. It's what our brain does normally with the information. If you walk into a room and you look around that room, you take in all the things going on in the room and you make assumptions or you figure out what's happening. And the brain does that for someone with dementia too. It's just often not true what's being said or what's being thought of. But to that person, it's true. And so if you're going, hmm, yeah, no, that's yeah, I don't know you. That's kind of wrong. My name's not Kelly. What? Why do you think that? Then that really could be a problem for someone. All right. Now, here's a big one. Mail and finances. And I know most people are really private about their finances. And I'm sure can can attest to this. But there are some things that we can notice or look at, even if we're not directly involved in finances. And one is, is there a lot of unopened mail? You know, if, if there's a good stack of unopened mail and our loved one says, yeah, I just haven't gotten to that yet. I was busy getting ready for you to come to the house. I'll look at it later. And you notice that they're not really looking at it later. There could be bills in there that they're missing. Um, so that could be a problem, especially if that's if it's something they're usually on top of paying their bills. Another thing is um, if you see a notice that they've gotten in the mail that says they haven't paid something, you know, you may it may be sitting on the counter or something, and and there's a warning that they're going to get their electricity cut off because they haven't paid, and somebody's been always on time with their bills. That could be a big warning sign that they've missed paid. Or if they're getting refunded because they've paid a bill twice. And that can be another big warning sign for finances. Another thing to keep in mind is if you see a lot of thank you letters from groups like Publishers Clearinghouse or other organizations like that, or any kind of charity, but if a lot of variety of charities are sending thank you letters uh, for donations, especially, then we might have a big problem. What tends to happen is people with dementia lose reasoning and logic and they get a plea, you know, for me to send a donation to help the children. And so, of course, I want to help the children. So I write them a check. And then I get on a list, a solicitation list, and everybody else sends me money. And so for every request, if I'm sending donations to all of these organizations that are asking me for money, 
then I could really be taken advantage of very easily. Now this does happen with seniors who don't have dementia as well. So it is something to be on the lookout for, but especially with people with dementia. Um, I had a friend who we didn't really realize this was happening with him, but we helped, he was moving and we helped him clean out a closet in his house. And he had all of these little prizes that he, got from donating money to a certain organization. If you give $5, we'll send you this. If you give $10, we'll send you that. And it turns out he had a closet full of these little $5, $10 gifts from this one organization because every time they were sending him a letter, he was sending them money, um, thinking that they needed his help and he did not have good control over his finances. So it's very hard to go into your parents and say, you know what, I think we need to look at the checkbook or we need to look at the finances together. It's a conversation none of us want to have, but it's sometimes very, very necessary for us to have those hard talks or those hard conversations. But first, let's see if there's something else going on. So another big area that is really difficult that a lot of people don't want to talk about, we kind of want to be an ostrich and put our head in the sand, is driving. And, you know, driving is independence. Someone's been driving since they were 16. Some people have been driving since they're 14 years old. And, you know, that's control. And so how do you know if somebody should? shouldn't be driving. Well, my first question is always, are you comfortable riding in the car with them? And if you are not comfortable riding in the car with them, then no. Right there, that answers your question. But we need to look at other things like are there new scratches or dents on the fenders or doors? Um, you know, does the bumper have a little extra ding on it? And what's the, you know, do we know about that? Um, is your person more stressed out when they're driving or are they driving much slower or much faster than they've always done in the past? Um, I know um, my grandmother, when she had dementia, she started slowing down her driving just a little bit at first. But when it got to the point that she was going slower than everyone else on the road around her, it became a hazard for her and for everyone else. And so we had to talk to the doctor at that point. And the doctor suggested to her that she not drive anymore. And often um, that's a good way to approach that conversation. If you are having any of these issues with your family member and you're not sure how to address that, I do want to encourage you to call the navigators or the social workers here at Dementia Alliance because that's why they're here. Those are free calls and we will be sending you the recording of this. So you'll have all the information but we'll also send you the slides that have our contact information on there. And you can go to our website, DementiaNC.org, and you can ask those tough questions. You can brainstorm, how do I have this conversation? You can even practice that difficult conversation before you have it with your person who might need to stop driving. So let's talk, we talked, we mentioned this before, but let's talk a little bit about awareness. Now, I'd like to ask all of you, for if you have a loved one or a person with dementia, do you feel that they're very aware of the changes that are going on? Or do you feel like they don't realize that there's a problem? Um, and sometimes it can be both. It's very difficult for people. For you, you can drop in the chat or you can unmute and just uh, share with us. Do you think they are aware that there's an issue? And um, I have to tell you in my personal situation, I think that occasionally we know there's an issue, but sometimes we don't know there's an issue. So when it comes to driving, there's no recognition that there's any problems. But then when we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and it said, you know, I don't really remember us talking about that before you tell me again there is a little bit of awareness of that so um 
Marty said, mom just passed, but she went through a period where she knew something was going on. And um, I've known people living with dementia that very much knew what was happening. And um, people with dementia who do not see that there's a problem at all. And um, Karen says mom is in denial. She believes her memory is perfect, although there's been a diagnosis of mild dementia. So there is this thing with dementia. And on the slide, we have the word for you, which is on a, I can't ever say it, an anosognosia. And it's actually a condition that results from the damage that a um, the dementia has done to our brain. And the area of the brain that would be aware of what's going on with us is no longer self-aware. So we don't see that there's a problem. That's not on purpose, um, but it's an actual part of this condition where I don't recognize that there are any issues. So Sharon, it might be I don't want to believe that, or I don't really think there's an issue. And oftentimes it's the person doesn't see that it's as bad as they think, as you think it is. Oh, I have some memory issues, but it really doesn't get in my way. And you're going, oh yes, it does get in your way. Definitely gets in your way. Um, but it could be too that they're just not aware at all of those issues. And each person with dementia is different. Dementia affects, we all look different, our brains are all different, we think differently, and so dementia happens differently because it's going on in our brain. And so every single person is different. So it could be, I'm not seeing the uh, severity of the issue. It could be I'm not seeing an issue at all. Or it could be that I just really don't wanna think about that. And none of those are wrong, it's just what's happening. But we do need to remember that if this didn't start it's this has taken us a long time to get to this place and so sometimes the fix takes a little bit longer um, let's see Kelly said my 88 year old mother-in-law's retired RN oh that's tough because she probably knows everything right Kelly <laughs> uh, it's challenging to get her to go to the doctor cognitive decline due to dehydration I'm sure that that's been an issue. Um, does anybody else want to share? I know we have some unmuted mics. Well, I was just going to mention, um, my mom would have been 100 years old this year, but passed away about seven years ago. But um, her driving career came to an end. Um, and, and you all may notice these. If you look at the handicapped parking spots, oftentimes there's a six inch cement pipe at the end of the parking area and it's it's to protect uh, people like my mother who came in and missed the, the brake and hit the uh, accelerator and just put a, a one foot dent into her Lincoln Continental and airbags went off and they called the EMS people they called me and you know the car was totaled luckily she ran into a, po a pole and not somebody else, but um, you know those sort of things. If people are aware of it, that's why they make the the, the handicap parking uh, the way they do. You, you may not have noticed that, but next time you you see one, you might notice this big old cement pipe in there. Yeah, it's so that you you stop when you feel that bump. If you get to that bump, it, it makes you stop normally. Um, and I have thank you for sharing that, Ken. I have heard of people that. Um, either their reaction time was too slow to go from one pedal to the other, or they hit the wrong one, not knowing often. So very, very scary. Um, Kathy shared that mom sort of knew and she kind of stopped driving on her own, um, which is a blessing in a lot of ways. And that, you know, is how we would all wish that it would happen um, is that, um, we sort of go, yeah, I'm not doing that so well anymore. Or if we have someone else with us that can drive, we always say, okay, well you drive. Um, and that's, that's really important. Um, but not always the case as some folks don't see that issue. Now let's talk a little bit about what's going on during that visit. So if you're not usually there with your loved one and, and you know that there's issues going on, but you come in and mom just sees 
seems on point or dad's just answering all the questions and, and, and wow, this is not like what, you know, on the phone, he's been struggling a lot, but, but now it seems like he's really getting it. Um, keep in mind that the neurotransmitters in our brain that are depleted during dementia, um, when we have an endorphin rush, so when we have that feel good moment, that endorphin rush, that excitement, because my wonderful son is coming to visit, the endorphins can help the neurotransmitters get to where they're going better. And so I may actually do better for a while. Now, the problem with that is after our endorphin rush, we kind of hit the bottom. The endorphins go up and then they come down. And so I may do well for a day. I may do well for a few hours, but at some point I'm gonna have that crash and I'm not gonna do as well. So yes, if you go over to someone's house and you spend two hours with them and they don't seem like there's a problem at all, there may not be, but, but if you're still wondering, you need to spend a longer amount of time with that person. And if you can stay with them for a few days and see day in and day out of their routine, what's going on. People with dementia do very well, um, pretty far into the disease when they are in their own environment and their own routine and they're following schedules and habits that they've always done. When anything changes, that's when we have a problem. That's when people start to struggle. Um, when things aren't normal, um, then we get frustrated. A lot of times we may get angry. So if the grandkids aren't usually in the house and they've been in the house for a while and I suddenly yell for them to stop and be quiet and sit down, they may just be on my nerves, but it could be that my stress threshold is very low because my dementia has lowered that. Um, and so I can't deal with stress as well. And so normally I would say, now kids, you need to stop that. But instead I yell or I'm mean. And it's not intentional. It's never intentional. That's the dementia talking. Now, if people do have some insight, a lot of times they may feel very depressed. They may be blaming themselves issues. And so that's sort of the other side of the coin instead of, no, I don't have a problem. It may be, oh, I really do have a problem. Maybe I shouldn't do these things anymore. And then we have to support the other, the person in the other way. And we never know how that's going to be. We just really don't. So what can we do in the moment? What can we do right now while we're visiting with mom or dad or grandma or whoever to make things better. Um, so some of the things that we can do is we can look at when is the best time of day for them and do the things that take the most energy during that time. So if they're not a morning person and they do better in the afternoon, we need to have our holiday events in the afternoon. Um, and we need to make sure that those are shorter than they normally would be and that they are not as hectic and busy. Um, if we normally have 20 people around, we wanna shrink that down. Um, they may do okay with five people and not with 20 family members around. And with COVID, maybe the five is better anyway, but that's a whole nother story. Um, we need to watch our person for signs of distress, signs of them getting tired, um, sometimes that could be something as simple as, oh, I'm getting a headache, or they're starting to feel a pain that they weren't complaining about before. Um, sometimes it's, I just need, need to take a little break. Sometimes they don't realize themselves that they need to take a break, but they maybe are getting distressed in the conversation or the moment. And so everybody else needs to take a break to give mom some quiet time. We need to try and go where they are. So if mom really thinks that we need to do this one thing, if I can make it happen, I'm gonna make it happen. So if mom always makes the pumpkin pie, we probably want to make sure that mom can still do that. And if mom can't generally do that, we want to try and help her. So what can we do? 
if mom's not been able to prepare the entire meal like she always has, maybe we can say, you know, mom, you've always made the pumpkin pie and I've never gotten it just right. Could we make it together this year? And let me learn from you. And that way you're doing it together. And if mom is missing steps, you can kind of fill in for her. So if mom says, I'm not sure about the, the pie crust for that. And if you know how she does it, you can say, oh, well, um, you know, mom, you usually have some in the freezer. Let me look and just see if there's any or if we need to run to the store. I'll do that for you. And then you can see if the pie crust is there. But there's a sign there that mom isn't kind of on the game fully. Um, and then you can say, mom, is there a recipe written down? And if there is, you can see if mom's following the recipe. If she generally does it from memory, is she having problems doing that? Is she having problems following the steps? But that way you're doing it together. You're not saying, mom, you're having a problem with this. You're just helping support her in the process. Um, if mom says, you know, I didn't put a Christmas tree up this year, it was just, just too much work for me and I didn't think we needed it. Okay, well, if we think there's a problem, maybe that was too complicated a process for mom. So mom, since I'm here, would you mind if I got the Christmas tree and the kids and I helped decorate it? And let's see what she says. Um, so we can sort of gauge things like that. Now, we don't want to assume the worst, but sometimes if you already have an idea that something's going on and that mom has not been doing so well, um, you already, you kind of know, you have to trust, trust your gut. You have to say there's something here or I wouldn't be worried. And so what do we need to do to support mom right now? So we make the holiday easier. But now after we get through the holiday, what do we do? After we get through the holiday and I'm back home from my visit, I call Dementia Alliance and I say, hey, Rosalind at Dementia Alliance, I need help. I think mom's struggling. What should I do? I call mom's healthcare provider and say, I think mom needs to be seen for an appointment. How can we make that happen? Um, now, maybe you have the conversation with mom. Mom, when we were together, it seems like you were maybe having some problems with your memory. Have you noticed that too? How do you feel about that? Um, and we want to make sure that we're very supportive in those conversations. Sometimes people can go, I don't have any problems. What are you talking about? You're the one with problems. And they can be very, very paranoid. And we need to come up with an approach then that can help you um, approach the situation for somebody who's maybe not as eager to go to the doctor. I am going to share with you when I send out the uh, recording of this, I am going to share with you a booklet that we have come up with at Dementia Alliance called Is There a Problem? And I think I have one here that I can, can kind of see. Um, but it just says, is there a problem? And it's got a lot of steps on what do we look for? And how do I get somebody to the doctor? How do I get somebody to the doctor if they want to go? And how do I get somebody to the doctor if they don't want to go? And then what kind of doctor do I talk to about this kind of thing? Um, so there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of very personal factors that go into making these decisions. And if you have a mom like Kathy's who's somewhat aware and someone in her family has had Alzheimer's and she kind of knows maybe things aren't right, you know, let me go with you, mom, and help you through this probably is going to work very well for her. If you have somebody else, maybe like Sharon's mom, who's not as aware of these changes, um, maybe we need to come at it from a different point of view and say, mom, have you gone for your annual physical? Yeah, you know, I just went for mine and just wondered, you know, if you've gone. And then if she hasn't gone, you can call the um, doctor's office and say, I would like to speak to the nurse before my mom's appointment. And it's not a HIPAA problem because they're not sharing information with you, you're sharing information with them. Um, and so you can do that. So um, 
I have a little bit more in the slides, but I'm really not going to go through those because I want to make sure that if anybody has any questions that we talk about those. Um, I know a couple of you had submitted. Kent, go right ahead. Well, um, so one of the services that we provide for our clients is to make sure they have all of their estate documents, their wills, their powers of attorney, their HIPAA documents, all of those are taken care of. And we make sure that all of the uh, contracts, IRAs, 401ks, life insurance, all that sort of thing have the proper beneficiaries. But I have a couple right now who the husband is starting to show issues and the wife is concerned and um, the, the, the thing you have to think about is, well, suppose something happens to her first and now he's left alone and he's unable to manage money or, you know, pay bills or he's never done it. I mean, she's done everything and he's never done it. So uh, making sure that you have the, the right chain of people in the document. So if if one person can't do it, then who's going to be the backup? And you know who's the backup to the backup and all of that so i mean that's we we get the so attorneys important. involved and get all that taken care of yeah yeah thank you for bringing that up it's so important and those are the conversations that we not only need to be having with our parents but with our children as well um, if something were to happen to me um, sometimes and especially COVID has brought this out where is the paperwork where does it live because if it's in a safety deposit box we may not be able to get to the safety deposit box when we need that information. So is it on file somewhere else? Do I have copies of that? Have we assigned a power of attorney? And you know that power of attorney doesn't kick in until it needs to, but we need to have that person assigned and who is it and do they know? Um, and we need to make sure that if we have documents that were completed, you know, a lot of people did these 10, sometimes 20 years ago, we've got to update all of that information. And so it's always easier to do that before we need it. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, we don't find out that we need it until it's kind of, you know, an emergency or something. But we really do need to make sure that not only are we doing that for our parents, but for ourselves as well. So such a great great point Kent and you know we can go and talk to somebody like Kent and make sure that we've got what we need in place for finances we can you know get with an elder law attorney if we need to to work on all the adv other advanced directives and you know again some people are very open to having those conversations um, in my family it's always okay, the, I just want to share this with you. I haven't shared it with you in about six months. This is where the paperwork lives. This is who's on it. And everything's, you know, very clear. Um, but even with that, occasionally I have questions or I'm like, what did they tell me about this? And I'm supposed to know that. And so I need to ask those questions again, very important. So um, hopefully this has helped you guys really maybe take a look at some things that, we don't normally pay attention to when we're visiting our loved ones for the holidays. Something that um, maybe we wouldn't necessarily have been on the lookout for expired medications before or um, moldy food in the refrigerator. Um, we may or may not have noticed those things. But now if we think that there is a problem with mom and maybe it simply is mom's getting older and she needs more help in her home. It's not dementia, it's just she needs more help or maybe there actually is more to it than that. Um, it's really important that during these times we sort of pay attention to those other details. And again, if you really feel like something's going on and you really feel like there's a problem, there probably is something to investigate there. So um, anybody else have anything they wanna share? Sharon, hopefully we, we answered some questions for you about mom a little bit. Um, we, our navigators would love to talk to you more about what's going on with her. Kelly, do you have any other advice for us? I know you, you work in this field a lot, so.
We can't hear her. My my background, my father had Alzheimer's and um, my mom took care of them at home. We were very fortunate to be able to do that with hospice the last eight months. And um, and also one of his older sisters and a younger brother had it, so family history. Um, and now with my mother-in-law, again, um, a retired RN does not make a good patient when family is trying to encourage her to address things. So that's our challenge right now. But um, I just think all the information you shared is great just for us to, to be aware and, and to, to ask for grace. And hopefully that we um, are sensitive to those folks um, and where they are in the disease, if they are aware of it, you know, just to reassure them that we're in this with them. That's, I think, the biggest part of all this is just um, that they're not alone in this and that we're going to hang with them through all the challenges. Absolutely. So true. We want to come at this if we're talking to anybody with dementia as I'm on your side and I'm here. Yeah. And not, don't you remember? I told you this and that, and I actually am going to send you guys a thing called the 10 absolutes or what I call is just caregiver homework, which is, you know, don't argue and don't reason and try logic. And then if you can't get the person to do the thing you need them to do, redirect their attention into something else um, and, and choose your battles, if you will. So Sharon, um, I know you're unmuted. Share a little bit more with us. Uh, as everyone has said, it's been great information today. Um, I think the brochure would help me as well. Um, I'm also looking for ways to learn how to talk to my mom so that um, when we do talk, um, she's able to understand me. And so it does not become confrontational and we actually have good days. Um, and also sharing the video, I have a brother in California and my sister is also local, but uh, they do not live with, um, they don't have mom with them. So helping them to understand what I experience every day seeing her, um, this information would be helpful because um, the topic when you were speaking about endorphins and how momentarily for a short period of time, a person with dementia can seem like they're there and they're on it and they're remembering things. That's what my brother and sister, uh, that's what they experience because they're only having 10 minute, uh, very short conversations. Um, whoops. But it's been good information and I will definitely follow up with uh, one of the social workers at North Carolina Dimension Alliance uh, just to get tips. Um, as far as my planning for myself, um, you know, also follow up with Kent so I can make sure that there is a plan there for my daughter so she does not have to figure things out as she goes along. Um, you know, there was no plan. <laughs> there was no plan and that was the problem. <laughs> Yeah, and often we don't plan. We don't do that. We're young. We don't need plans, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think COVID has shown us that we do. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. And um, I will also include in the email a link to another YouTube video that we have done on empathetic communication with um, an RN trainer named Melanie Bunn. And it's really helpful in those conversations. So I think that might be a really good one for you and your family to watch Sharon on uh, how to have those conversations with mom okay. so that they don't turn confrontational. So I'll make sure we share that with you as well. So okay. I see Heather's back. Heather, did you have something you wanted to share with us? No, I was just going to say thank you all for, for being with us today, and I know I've learned a lot, too. Well, thank and you I, all so much. And thank Pooja. you, Lisa. Yes, I just wanted to thank you, both of you, Lisa and Heather. And Lisa, the presentation was great. I have learned some things on how I need to talk to my father-in-law. He was diagnosed, it's been like three or four years, and honestly, when, we, when I talk to him, he sounds so good that I... I haven't believed the diagnosis, but maybe he's running on that endorphin when I talk to him, you know, so that's given me something to think about. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Well, um, I wish you all well. 
um, during the holidays. And thank you so much, Kent, for sponsoring this program. That's an important conversation for all of us to have. And do remember that you're not in this alone. So whether you live in North Carolina or not, um, if you need a social worker to talk to, you're welcome to call our Dimension Navigators. Reply back to the email that I sent you, um, and we are always happy to share more because we are all in this together. Ken? Well, I would just simply mention that my motto is turning good intentions into action. So um, if, you, if there's something that you've been thinking about, and you you know you haven't been able to get it done you know i'll be happy to be your partner and we'll get it done together thank you so much we really appreciate that and thank you to everyone and we hope that you have a wonderful day thank you